I've just, I've been so, so fucking sad. Like, I, like to the point where I just, I didn't want to feel it anymore. I've had three different, like, suicide attempts. I've been slitting my wrists for 10 years. Um, I just don't want to feel that way anymore. So that's why when I tell my story, I don't, I don't want to bring up how I've OD'd 10, 13 times. I don't, I don't want to get into the depths of me hanging myself or trying to drown myself because um, I think the most important part is to just giving background of where I came from so that you can see why I became a drug addict. And then on top of that, like seeing that people do make it out, like it's not like that forever. And um, I'm just glad that I made it out when I did and realized that I can be happy and I deserve to be happy because all that shit that happens is just the outcome of actions. And if I make better actions now, then I know the outcome's gonna be far better than how it used to be. And I have faith in that. All right, Izzy. Izzy, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Um, I grew up in Salem, Massachusetts. And I ended up in Rhode Island, so most of my childhood was on the East Coast. And how was your family? Um, it was a weird setup. Um, my mom and dad, my dad met my mom in the strip club uh, before I was born, like 1997. And I don't know, my mom says that like I was wanted, but she was with him for a few months and uh, he ended up leaving around when I got was born because uh, my mom stabbed him. And he just, I don't know, I talked to him about it and he told me that he was just gonna let me, like let God work it out and I'll eventually find him. So I grew up with my mom. Uh, she was a sex worker for most of my childhood. Uh, it was like a, weird situation. She was very evil, I would say. <laughs> um, I was getting abused since I was like six years old physically. Um, my first grade picture, I had a black eye and she covered it with makeup that day. Um, I just got in trouble for a lot of things that like I didn't understand. Um, I don't know how it conspired, but uh, I, I was a very sexual kid. I, I can't recall, I don't think anything ever happened to me sexually, but I started having a porn addiction at around six or seven years old. I, I was uh, obsessed with like women specifically. I don't know if it was the hyper femininity from my mom or like, cause she was always like the sexy mom. I don't know what it was, but I, I remember in kindergarten, I had a girlfriend and we used to like make out in the bathroom stalls and like get naked. Uh, I just, I've always just been like addicted to women and sex as a whole uh, around like, 12 was when I started webcamming and it was just like weird for me because it wasn't something that my mom ever talked to me about. Uh, I just, when I was getting like phones and stuff, I would be looking up pictures of naked girls, like masturbating all the time on webcam until they would like kick me off servers. So I was just always really comfortable with sex and myself. Um, I remember when I was 12, my mom ended up like getting engaged to this rich dude. 
and we moved in with him to Rhode Island. That's when it, that's when I ended up leaving Salem, and that kind of like changed my whole entire life. Uh, I wasn't around my friends anymore. I was sexually super confused. Uh, I liked guys and girls, but I still had that like infatuation with women, and I didn't really know how to express that because as I got older. I was bullied a lot, so I really wasn't able to have that connection like I was when I was younger, and we don't really think about like judging kids and people. Um, I was I was was self harming at a, when I when I moved, and that's when I started getting really alternative and into like metal music. Um, I did want friends, but everything I did made me very unapproachable. So I kind of like singled myself out and didn't really understand why people didn't like me because I, I love people. I, I fall in love with like everybody I meet. And I started smoking weed and drinking when I got there. Uh, I, I used to like drink cough syrup out of like the cabinet when I was younger, but I wasn't like always looking for that high because I was getting the feelings I needed from like the sex kind of stuff. Um, anything that just makes me feel super in love, just I love that shit. And mm, I. I was running away a lot when I when I was in Rhode Island. I remember my mom was in jail for a little bit, so I was alone with this dude. Uh, I don't recall him ever being like creepy or weird with me, but it was just awkward because I didn't really know him, and she just had me move in with this dude into a whole other state. So I was just always, you know, finding f older friends that I could go hang out with. Um, and when my mom got back from jail, that's when it, the abuse started happening again. I mean, constant physical fights. Uh, the, the police knew me so well just as the girl that was always getting in fights with her mom. Um, she quit doing sex work around a little bit after we moved to Rhode Island, but I do remember her still going to the clubs and stuff. Uh, I always viewed her little fiance dude as a trick. I'm now that I'm a little bit older. I mean, I don't really see what there was to love about that whole situation. I remember one time he, like how they broke up was he got really drunk and was standing over my bed naked, and I don't recall anything happening. But she just didn't need that in my life. So he ended up like kicking us out and all this shit. It was just like a mess. Um, at around 13, 14 was when I started running away a lot. Uh, I, I had gotten in contact with my dad, but he was still far away. Uh, he, he definitely loved me. It was like he was waiting for me to eventually like reach out. She found him on Facebook and said, your daughter wants to talk to her. So he was like in my life kind of, but he was in Colorado at the time. So I remember on one of my little runaway stints. Now, when I ran away, since I'm like from small cities, I always gravitated towards big ones. Cause I'm like, I can't do anything out here. There's nothing to fucking do. And, um, and everybody knows me at this point. Like I'm, I'm normally like the one mixed girl. I'm, I'm Iranian and Puerto Rican. So like I, I was always like the one brown kid in most situations, and kind of hard to forget. So I would always, I remember like taking buses to Providence to take a train to Boston to take another train to New York, and. Um, yeah, I would just disappear. I would let my mom know, hey, I'm leaving, throw my SIM card out, and I would just be out on the streets, and I'd just come back when I came back. Each time was a little different. Um, I used my body to get around places. 
uh, I'd lie about my age, but people knew who I, like, when you're 14, you can't really pass for much than 14. I didn't, I got a boob job right now. Like, I was flat chested. I have a baby face. So, I mean, but it didn't really bother me. My mom supported me like that. Like, just being hot. So I figured as long as I look good, you know, I was the one girl on the streets. I'd have my straightener, my makeup, and, like, a bunch of hoochie mama outfits. And, um, and it worked. I, I definitely, I was okay. I was on the streets a lot, but I'd always find a way to get into someone's apartment and have a place to stay for a little bit and until I got tired of the runs, and then I'd just come back home and... I don't know, my mom stopped really worrying about me. I was, um, whenever I, there was like a report for me missing, it wasn't because she reported it. She knew I'd always end up back home and there was nothing she could really do about it. Um, and then when I was like 15, just turning 16, I met this dude who was like 10 years old, older than me and I was in love with him. Um, I ended up moving into his apartment pretty quickly. Uh, his friends knew how old I was. I, I used to brag, I'd be like, I just turned 16. Like that was like any better being with somebody who was like 25, 26. So he took care of me. And um, like I said, I'm a lover. And uh, my idea of loving someone is being able to provide for them. And I wasn't really able to do that at the time. I had fucked up school. I never went. And um, so it was hard for me to get jobs and such. So I started posting ads. I mean, on the streets, it was different when you're just like meeting up with people. But this is when I started putting myself out there. Um, I was doing pet play where you, to my knowledge, when I was a like teen, I got into it because it was cute. You wear little cat ears and like butt plugs and you pretend you're a cat. Now I'm like a big anime fan. So I just, I didn't see the problem with this and I didn't understand the underlying kink behind it. Um, at this time, I was drinking and I was doing like smoking weed, um, but I really wasn't into like heavy, heavy drugs like that. And he didn't know what I was doing. I would just say I'm gone and come back the next day with money, and I wouldn't really like. I would. I honestly don't even remember my excuses for it. I just I had money, and I don't know. Um. Now, when I started, my first thing with meth was when I was seeing this dude. Um, I, he was very rich, and I, I knew his name because he was like kind of a high-profile client, as they would call them. And I remember walking into this big ass house and I felt safe because I'm like, well, somebody with a name and with that has this kind of publicity, like they they can't really afford to fuck me over. And I wasn't really ever scared of people. I mean, as long as I got paid and I didn't get like physically hurt, it really didn't bother me what was going on. And um, I remember this cute dog and I was like petting him while we were talking for a little bit and I was getting dressed. And then he told me that he likes to use meth to have fun. And I was like, okay, whatever. Um, I guess I've just always been adventurous. I was always one of those kids that would say, yeah, I'll try any drug. So I just did it. And um, he put me in this little cage and that was normal in a pet play scenario, you know, like cage, bowl, things, being on four knees, crawling around. But then he had his dog go in the cage with me. 
And I spent, I remember I went in on a Tuesday and he would just keep giving me meth and having his dog rape me. Um, and like, it's not something I really enjoyed, but when you're spun the fuck out, you don't really, I was just, I was grateful for it, you know? Uh, I was grateful for the meth, because whatever mind state I was in or what I was feeling was probably better than being sober. So he let me out after like a little over three, four days. I remember he said I work on the weekends and he gave me like, you know, like four grand or something. And I didn't even want to put up a fight. I mean, I was glad I was out. Looking back, I should have demanded way more money. I should have done something. I should have, I could have taken the money and I could have still reported him, but like, I did not give a fuck. I just wanted to leave. Um, and then that's when I remember going back to that boyfriend's house and he caught me. He like looked through my phone. I remember I brought back coffee and I kissed him and I was like, hey, I'm back. And um, I, I left to go shower and he looked through my phone and he saw all my ads. And um, that's when he told my mom and he told like the whole town that I was, that I was a hooker. Um, it was weird. I ended up going back to my mom's house and she had the pictures of the ads and she didn't even say anything. This is the woman who beat my ass for not cleaning my room, beat my ass for not coming home on time, beat my ass for anything. Me having an attitude and um, she just kind of like shrugged. She was like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm good. So like there was this thing in my head that like it was okay. It was okay. I was a sex worker. And um, part of me maybe even felt like, you know, I followed in mom's footsteps. Uh, maybe that's why she doesn't, you know, how, how the fuck can you blame me? Um, I saw how she provided for me. So that's how I provided for myself and people that I loved. Um, from there, my childhood gets a little splotchy. Um, I, I ran away a million times after that. Um, living in crack houses and um, I did eventually run back, run away to my dad's place in Colorado. Um, he tried to get me into school over there, but this is the man I've been dying to live with him. I've, I've been wanting to be in his life so bad and I finally get the fucking opportunity to and, uh, and I ran away because he felt more like a friend and not a father. I never even had a father to know like wh how one is supposed to be. He was supportive. He didn't care about like anything going on, like what I did. He just was glad I was in his life and I, I ran away to go be on the streets. Um, no, no, I just, I remember skipping school and him riding his bike around my school and finding me like, smoking fucking K2 that we got from the gas station. Um, just liked being high. Um, and yeah, sex work just was the thing I did. I didn't even, it, I don't really, f I don't know where the correlation between me being a sex worker and the, um, and my sex addiction really connects because I'm, um, Sex work always felt like a job and it wasn't really something I enjoyed like that. But I didn't really have a problem with it either. Uh, drugs helped that a lot. Uh, got into, I got into meth pretty heavy in my teen years because it's just, I correlated it with safety. I felt safe. Um, you could do anything to me and I was good. So... That was like my childhood, I guess. Lots of drugs and sex and street life.
the drug use continued? Yeah. Um, I was never really physically addicted to anything. I mean, I remember when I was younger, they would say, like, don't try meth even once. Like, you get addicted, and they'd show these horrible pictures of people, like, after a few months of use. Um, but I would go on, like, binges, and then I would just drop it. I mean, it was really hard for a teenager to get meth. It's like, I don't know, maybe it was just where I was looking, but I, I kind of just did whatever. But I was never physically addicted to anything, but I did always need to be fucked up. Um, when I was 18, that's when I got into porn, and they flew me out to Florida. And I, I had a rule. I would never get fucked up on camera because I didn't want people to see me like that. I know how embarrassing I am when I'm fucked up. So I would just do drugs and alcohol any time between. I mean, I was casually doing heroin, dropping it, doing something else, did a lot of coke. Um, Molly, I fucking loved Molly. I would do that shit for weeks until I would get clean off of it, and then I'd have, like, such bad headaches. I would fucking black out every once in a while. I don't know. It was just acid. Um, nothing major, though. Um, yeah, so throughout porn and being with sugar daddies all the time, I, uh, I always, I was always fucked up. Um, that's just how I lived my life, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and I, and I owned that shit. I, I always knew I had a problem using, um, and when I started doing meth and heroin, I, it, was, it was regular. I did fentanyl here and there, but it was never really like that fucking bad. Like I would actually do it once and I'd be like, okay, that was cool. And then I would like kind of forget about it. It wasn't something I always seeked out um, because I liked uppers. I didn't like feeling down and in my feelings and depressed. Um, my fentanyl addiction started about two years ago when, uh, I met this dude and I, the moment that I saw him, I was like, yeah, I definitely want to be with him. He's all tatted up and I, I always like was with like emo boys, alternative boys. I never really, since I've been in... Before L.A., I wasn't really around gangbangers except for when I was in the streets in New York, and, um, and I fucking hated them. They were so mean, and uh, I didn't really like the shit that they made me do because I was like, you know, it was always just money-based shit. If I wasn't helping make money, then it just wasn't, wasn't it. And I, I wanted to be in love, so I remember meeting this dude, and he hit me up after he saw me at a party. He said, when can I be with, he said, when can I see you? And I said, I'm yours whenever you want me. And we hooked up the next day. He told me when we were fucking, I wanna have a baby with you. I want you to, I, I like, I want you to be my wife and all this shit. And I said, bet, I got you. He, uh, he smoked 30s. And he always used to tell me, like, these are the real ones. We don't do fake shit. And I was like, okay, whatever. So, um, I don't know. We were, we were smoking them, and I didn't really get the physical addiction too bad, too bad. And then he got locked up, and I lost my shit. I, I need to be with the person that I'm with, like, all the time. I, I need to be able to see you, like, whenever. Um, so him being gone kind of just broke me down, and I started, I just wanted to be closer to him some way, somehow, so I just started doing what he did and smoking 30s all the time. Now, I didn't have his plug. I didn't want to ask him for it, so I was doing fake pills, and I liked them more. I like those way more. Um, I, I got way higher and um, 
Yeah, I ended up leaving and going to, this was when I was in Cali, and I ended up eventually leaving in the middle of him being in jail and going to Vegas, and then that's when I started getting, like, really good fucking fentanyl pills. And it was from there, I mean, I knew I was addicted, and I'd be getting sick when I wasn't on them, but I, I couldn't stop. And this was the first time I was physically addicted to something. I didn't understand, like, withdrawals. I didn't, and then, yeah, when he got out, I had tried going to treatment last year, and I didn't last more than like five days. Um, I was like, oh man, if I get high now, I can just stop after a day, and you know, I've tried to get clean repeatedly over the past couple years. But I just, I couldn't do it. I always replaced it with some sort of substance. So I, I was getting pissed because in my addiction, I, I couldn't even get high off heroin. The fentanyl was way more stronger. So I, that's when I started binging on meth a lot because it was just the complete opposite of a nod stay up for like days, weeks. Um, at one point I was in psychosis. So I ended up emitting the drugs, like the, the meth, but my brain was so fucked up. I was going through psychosis for like two, three more months after I got off the meth. And I was prescribed, um, prescribed pills for that. And it was just, it was a fucking mess. My mental health was already, I've, I've had depression and anxiety. I was in mental hospitals as a teenager for cutting and stuff. And they were always putting me on pills that I never fucking took. I, I always said they didn't fucking work. But, um, and I believe that now it's because my circumstances made me depressed and anxious. Being on the streets, hating myself. My, I, I feel like my mom fucking hates me. So... I just, that's why this time around, um, I'm, I'm not on meds. Uh, I feel a lot better. I've, I learned how to work through things. Um, I, got, I got actually clean. Um, I'm 107 days clean. That's when I went into treatment. That was the last time I did anything. Went into a 30-day program and continued my treatment. Um, it's different, you know? This is my first time in 10 years of addiction, being completely clean off everything, not taking any medications. Um, it's a lot of fucking work. Uh, I do a 12-step program. I'm an intensive outpatient. I, I, I don't know what's working, so I don't want to stop anything because um, I don't have another run in me. Um, a lot of my friends kind of just, like they knew me as a drug addict and they accepted me for that, but then when they saw how bad I was, they just kind of drifted off and never really told me why. And as somebody who like craves connection, that shit always just get, like was the biggest mind fuck to me. Cause I thought I was a really good friend. I was like, my problems aren't, has nothing to do with you, why I smoke and do all these things. But um, you know, it's a lot better now. I'm happy. I want to help other women. I, I really want to help like teen sex workers. Um, I have nothing against sex work. Um, there's some badass bitches that do that shit and they rock it. But I, I know there's girls like me who just kind of end up doing it and you get so locked on that financial security and feeling like you're never going to make as much money as you do when you're selling pussy. And that's just, maybe that is the truth, I don't know. But I, I'm my happiest right now, making zero money, working on myself, um, working on the art and reading. Like, I, I have so many things that I loved doing as a kid that I just stopped doing. So, um, you know, making fucking clothes. I, I want to provide those kind of opportunities for girls that, that are in my position. I care about all addicts, but I feel like um, when, when you have a background of sex work, you, it kind of gets 
stigmatized. I remember hearing somebody that saw me in treatment, they they ended up saying about me like, oh, she's gonna end up right back on the streets. She made too much money. She's not gonna wanna work in treatment. And I just, I laughed when I heard that. Like, if I cared about money, I'd still be doing that. I, I want peace of mind. I wanna, I wanna wake up and not be sick. So I definitely just see myself working in treatment so that I can just pass along what I know now with all the knowledge I do, with no judgment, because um, sex workers are fucking amazing. The women who, who feel like, you know, all I need is me, like that's some powerful shit. Um, but I just think that there's so many better opportunities and when drugs get wrapped into it, I know at least for me, Maybe if I was sober, I would have been so uncomfortable in the situation, like all the situations that I have been in, I wouldn't have even continued doing it as long as I have. I mean, nobody wakes up and says, I want to be a sex worker at 15 years old. It was a combination of a sex addiction, feeling like I wasn't wanted, one not even wanting to be home and I need to provide for myself somehow. Like there's always some underlying thing with these things that we do that we don't understand why at first. So I don't know, just taking it one day at a time. Try not to future trip too much. Lizzie, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in all of this? Um, forgiveness. Um, Forgiving others for being sick, forgiving yourself for being sick. Um, I just don't see how I'd be able to make it through this without being able to forgive myself for all the things I've done, the manipulation I've done against men so that I could take care of myself and other people. Um, forgiving myself for my, like my childhood self, for not for just jumping to conclusions that I wasn't loved. When now I understand, like my mom had so much going on in her life, she, I could see why it was hard to deal with me. Um, I just, I think that's the most important thing because we can't like dread over stuff that's been happening or, and I don't, because of my addiction, I just, I understand that there's so much more going on than just what meets the eye. So, yeah. All right. Izzy, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you for letting me share. And I wish you the best of luck from here. Thank you. Good luck with rehab. Thank you. Thanks.